Across the country, college students are back on campus, and many are taking out tens of thousands of dollars in loans to be there. Americans now carry well over a trillion dollars in student debt, and many fear we're at a tipping point. In Congress, Oregon Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici is taking steps to fix the student loan crisis. She joins us today to talk about those efforts, along with a woman who went through the difficult process of having her loans forgiven. From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Millions of people across the country are weighed down by student debt. Forbes magazine says student loan debt in 2019 is the highest ever. 45 million borrowers owe collectively one and a half trillion dollars. What's more, students who were promised their loans would be forgiven if they went into public service for 10 years and made 120 on-time loan payments are now finding 10 years later that promise broken and they still owe tens of thousands of dollars. That's not sitting well with Oregon Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici, who's addressing the issue head on. On another front, Bonamici has also been fighting for stronger protections for older Americans. And she's on a House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Here to tell us about progress she's made, welcome to my guest, Oregon First District Congresswoman Suzanne Bonamici. We're also joined by Beaverton fifth grade teacher Kristen Faust, who's one of the few people to successfully fight to have her public service student loan forgiven. She tells us how she did it. Welcome to Straight Talk. It's great to have you both here. Thank you. It's Thank great you. to be back. Well, let's start with a public service loan sure. forgiveness program. It started under the Obama administration. It was designed for students who wanted to go into public service. Right. If they went into public service, which generally pays less in the private sector for 10 years, they made all their loan payments, right. qualified payments. Right. Then 10 years later, mm -hmm. those loans would be forgiven. It was a really great incentive. But now, for a lot of people, the 10 years is up. And what's happened, Congresswoman? Well, thank you for the opportunity. And as someone who worked my way through first community college, then college and law school with a manageable amount of debt, the student loan debt crisis has been a, a significant concern for me. So uh, we did a survey on my website. We had more than 700 responses from local Oregonians. And I saw so many people concerned about the public service loan forgiveness program. And as you mentioned, it started uh, quite a few years ago. It passed in Congress in 2007. Uh, before I was there, I was in Salem at the time, but the goal was to incentivize uh, people to get into public service jobs that are so important. Teachers, firefighters, uh, people who are doing uh, community service. This is important to have uh, people in those fields. And as you mentioned, Laurel, they typically make less than the private sector. So there was this deal. You go into public service, you make your payments for 10 years, 120 payments, and then your balance is forgiven at the end. It's turned out to be an empty promise, and it's really been devastating for so many people. Uh, we found out in 2017, which was the first year of eligibility, because making the payments for 10 years, only about 1% of the borrowers were having their balance forgiven. So that meant a lot of people incredibly disappointed because they made career decisions and, and education decisions based on this program. So then in 2008, Congress passed legislation directing the Department of Education to fix this, simplify it, make it uh, the promise that it was dis designed to be. And now, after uh, about a year, about 1% are having their loan, ba loan balances forgiven. So this is a serious issue. I had a wonderful roundtable discussion where Kristen came and told her story. I heard several other stories from Oregonians. Uh, we had a hearing in Washington, D.C., and we are committed, committed to making this program work and to fulfilling the promise that was made to so many people who well, went into public service. It's gotta be service. so maddening for people who, who went into public service and gave Absolutely. 10 years of their life. Kristen, Absolutely. you were one of the very few who got your loan forgiven, and I wanna <laughs> yes. hear more about that, but let's hear more about your story. So you went to the University of Oregon. I did. Tell us what your expectation was when you took out your student loans. So going to U of O, I knew that my dream was to become an educator, and so, um, in order to do that, I would have had to have my undergrad and my master's degree funded with student loans. So I took those out and entered the teaching profession and learned pretty early on that the 
um, the public service loan forgiveness program had been established with bipartisan support. So I did the paperwork at that point and was told that everything was on track. And flash forward almost a decade later, um, I wanted to make sure that my paperwork was being submitted prior to the 10 year mark. And so I submitted it a little bit early and that's when everything came to a screeching halt. Um, it became a nightmare with one problem after another. Um, I had completed my 10 years of education and I love, love, love my job and I love my students, but there's, um, there's a lot of other temptations to go work in the private sector due to higher pay and some different benefits that happen that way. And um, a lot of educators are working in lower paying jobs so that they can service the community and help offer these supports to so many people in Oregon. And to have that promise not fulfilled at the end was, um, it was really disheartening. What did they tell you in the beginning about why they weren't going to fulfill that promise? Um, it was one excuse after another. I was told that five years of payments were missing um, for over the course of a year. I was challenging that, was never getting any phone calls back. They would just say, oh, it's under review. You'll hear from us in two weeks and then another two weeks. And over a year passed and nothing ever happened. Um, I had been told that I should consolidate my loans. Um, luckily, I didn't take that advice because if you do consolidate, consolidate your loans, your payments go right back to zero and you have to do another 10 years. Um, so there's a lot of people in my situation that have had that problem happen. Um, there, there, it's very clear that um, the people working for Fed Loan Servicing, which is the servicing company that takes over mm -hmm. the student loans when you apply for forgiveness, um, are giving a lot of misinformation and there's a lot more questions than answers that are provided. How did you finally get it resolved? Because you've had your loans forgiven now, I right? have. I am very, very lucky um, to be one of the 1% approximately mm -hmm. of people who have had that happen. So um, after fighting for over a year, um, I realized that things weren't going well and something was wrong. Um, so I started documenting every phone call and every discussion that I had with Fed Loan Servicing. And then I started reaching out to Congresswoman Bonamici's office as well as the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau and the Ombudsman's office for the Department of Ed. And after reaching out to many, many other companies, um, it took a several year process at that point of um, just nonstop advocacy and eventually I was able to get them forgiven. And what did that mean to you, to file, to your life, to have $30,000? Oh $30, <laughs> it's 30000 right? Yes, it was. So it was $30,000, and at the end I was paying approximately $550 a month, which is um, a very large amount when you're working on an elementary teacher's salary. Um, so it it felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders, and like my family and I could... Um, you know, not feel the burden of having a lifetime of debt holding us down anymore. So it was a significant blessing, but definitely one that had to be fought for. What tips can the both of you give someone who's listening who may be in the same boat? What would you say, Kristen? I would suggest documenting every single mm -hmm. call, email, and interaction with anybody that gives you advice um, before making any changes to the type of loan payment that you're in or before consolidating. You need to verify with multiple sources, including reading the documents to make sure that it's accurate. So many times we call the 1-800 number and we assume that the information that we're told is accurate. Um, but I've even had people from Fed Load Servicing tell me on the phone that there's a lot of um, people that aren't receiving the training they're supposed to. So there's misinformation being given out. So you need to be your own advocate and make sure that you're documenting everything. And when I had my um, roundtable discussion about this, Kristen was the only one there who had the forgiveness. We heard from a woman named Holly, who's a paralegal in her 60s. She said she doesn't know if she'll be able to retire because she has student loan debt. Uh, we heard from someone who's an executive assistant who had uh, ma been making payments. Who want, she wants to get married, um, but she said she can't because then her spouse's salary will drive her payments up and they won't be able to make their payments. We heard from a woman who is in the 
served in the military, she made payments for eight years that they didn't recognize. So the frustration after frustration from people around the table who were working hard, but getting inconsistent information. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'll say you have to consolidate your loans to be in the program. Then, you, then people would call back and they'd say you're not eligible because you consolidated your loans. So things like that are very, very frustrating for people and, and New York who made State, these decisions. Mm -hmm. And New York yes, State so. is suing that yes. you mentioned Fed Loan Servicing is the company that they're suing, mm -hmm. saying alleging uh, widespread mismanagement of the loan forgiveness program. Right, right. That complaint says, and this is mm -hmm. just what you said, 1%. The complaint says only 900 of the 90,000 borrowers who filed for debt forgiveness were approved. Do you see Oregon possibly filing a similar lawsuit? I think it would be possible. Um, based on the survey that we did, there's a lot of people who are in this situation in Oregon who made education and career decisions based on this promise. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised, but we are doing in the legislative branch in Congress, uh, we're doing the, the, the work that we need to do. I, I want to say, though, the, the company that runs Fed Loan Servicing, it's a company in Pennsylvania, we invited them to the hearing to answer questions. They didn't show up. So, so what so, happens next? What can Congress do? Are you optimistic that it can fix this? Well, we're continuing to work with the Department of Education, and it's really their responsibility. They're supposed to be administering the program. Of course, they, they outsource this, this piece of it, uh, but it's still their responsibility. And we want to make sure that the government is, the Department of Education is fulfilling that promise uh, because so many decisions were made in reliance on this program. So we're going to do everything we can to make sure that, that other join Kristen uh, in that you know, it's, a, it's a commitment for 10 years. You make your payments for 10 years, then you have your balance forgiven. And it's probably why people decided to go into certain fields. You say you know a lot of people that are facing this. Absolutely. I think um, even within my school and my colleagues, I know several people who have experienced the same hurdles. Um, as a larger group with people I went to college with, I've heard from um, numerous other people who are facing this, so it's very mm -hmm. common. Um, and I want to emphasize, this program I think is important. It was created with bipartisan support mm -hmm. because teacher turnover and public service um, frequently has um, higher turnover and um, it's harder to recruit, and I think it's really important that we have in education and mm -hmm. other public service the ability to recruit diverse populations so that they match the types of students that we're teaching. Um, but unfortunately, it's harder to do that with the salaries that are offered in education. And so being able to have the public service loan forgiveness um, is a great motivator to keep people in a profession where within the first year, first five years of teaching, oftentimes people leave the profession. I well, visited some firefighters recently, um, and we talked about you know issues like funding for safety equipment and workforce issues, and they said, we need to talk about the public service loan forgiveness program. So it really is, I mean, I, Kristen made a great point about it's really important to have people in uh, education, but it's a whole range of public service jobs. Uh, this program was designed, as Kristen said, with bipartisan support to make sure that people uh, could enter into public service. We have so many opportunities in the community, uh, and we need to make this from an empty promise to a real promise. For well, one us. article I read on the subject, and we talk about student loans in general, repayment plans already exist sure. that can offer, not forgiving, but to restructure their loans or their lower payments right. based on income. And you've been right. working on that yes, legislation. Indeed. And we have a list of some of the bills that you've been working on in Congress. One of them is called the Simple Act. It automatically connects student loan borrowers with income-driven repayment plans to help them avoid default. And the article I read said half of students don't even know some of these things exist. Right. So trying to navigate the system, empowering students through Enhanced Financial Counseling Act. It improves the timing, frequency, and content of the financial counseling students are required to receive when they take out federal student loans. The Opportunities for Success Act creates more opportunities for students to gain valuable work experience while they earn money to reduce the amount they have to borrow in the first place. Right. And then an amendment to the Consumer First Act requires the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to issue an annual report to Congress on the risk to young consumers and student borrowers. Are you encouraged that these are effective? What else do you want to see done? Well, those are all part of the solution, and I'm excited that we are working on uh, an update of the Higher Education Act, and I'm hopeful that 
All those pieces will be part of that. Just on the uh, income-driven repayment to avoid t default, um, we found that a lot of borrowers in income-driven repayment would miss the deadline to update their income annually. But the Department of Treasury can talk to the Department of Education. We've, we found a way to automate that to keep people in income-driven repayment. But in the long term, Laurel, we need to make higher education more affordable and accessible. Um, it, this is an equity issue uh, to make sure that everyone who chooses to go to college has that path and no one is denied those opportunities uh, because of income. And it is a good investment. So we need more Pell Grants. We need more work study, which is what you're talking about, get on the job experience while reducing the amount of debt. We need to let borrowers refinance at lower rates for existing borrowers. But in the long run, debt-free education is what we really need. We just have a few seconds left, Kristen. Do you have a final thought you'd like to leave with viewers? Um, I just think it's really important that we complete or that we continue to support public um, services. We have a lot of trauma that's been facing communities in Oregon and across the country lately. And so mm -hmm. continuing to support mental health services and um, safety services and other public service that can help to benefit the communities is critical. Well, Kristen, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank and you for having me. Thank you for your service as a teacher. I hope you have thank a great you. school year. Thank you. When we come back, we'll hear about legislation Congresswoman Bonamici is very excited about that will help millions of older Americans and what she's doing to fight climate change. We're back after the break.